Uh, so to look at regularization, uh, for now we're just going to be using the exact same setup as before. So we have our inputs, we have our predictors, and given those predictors, we're just going to try to find some sort of function to model or predict our response y. We're still going to be using for our f, we're still going to assume that it's just a linear model down here, and we are still going to be using the, uh, the squared error loss there. The only change now is that we're just going to add the second term to this minimization. So before, you know, we were looking at least squares, all we had was this here, but now we're adding the second term, this penalty term to it. And the penalty term is made up of two parts. One is lambda. This is going to be a non-negative regularization parameter. The second term, this j of beta, this is going to be a user-defined penalty function. So this is something that you, when you actually do regularization, you get to choose uh, what penalty you use. It's not necessarily something that you come up, up, come up with on your own. There's kind of a catalog of penalties that you can choose from, so I wouldn't necessarily sit and drive your own. If you do, that'd be great. You could probably publish something, but um, for what you're going to be doing, more than likely you're just going to be kind of pulling a penalty off the shelf and, uh, and using it. Uh, and another thing to keep in mind with this is that typically we don't penalize the intercept. The intercept is just kind of there to help us improve the fit. We're not necessarily going to uh, penalize um, you know, the intercept or anything. So to look at these two parts a little more closely, um, for now to kind of just see what the penalty function is really doing, we can just uh, consider using the uh, ridge regression penalty. So here are j of beta is we're going to just take the sum of the squared coefficient values, which is the, uh, the same as the L2 uh, vector norm squared, if you're uh, familiar with that. That's another way to write it. Uh, so when we look at this, again, instead of having the, you know, this j of beta, now I'm just going to plug in the actual ridge penalty down there. And to solve this problem, we actually have two equivalent ways that we can do it. So one way is that we, uh, you know, again, using the regularization framework I just showed you guys, all we do is we plug in the penalty we want to use, and we go through and do the minimization. An equivalent way, though, to actually formulate this problem is, is really basically starting out with the, uh, the same least squares setup that we had before, but it's going to be a constrained least squares in the sense that we're going to solve this subject to this constraint. And so you can see from this constraint a little more explicitly what the penalty function is actually doing is that we're looking at, um, you know, this penalty function really what it's getting at is we're just looking at the size of our coefficients. We're looking at the sum of the, the squared values. It's just one way to, to measure the, the size or the magnitude. And this t allows us to kind of tune that size and allows us to, if we want to shrink the coefficients and make them smaller, um, that's what uh, the penalty term is really, is really doing here. It's just really taking those coefficients and it's going to shrink them closer to zero, shrink, shrink them away from the, uh, the least squares estimates. Any questions on the, the penalty term before I keep going? Did you have a question, Justin? Was that? No, I was just going to say, so with these uh, tuning parameters, lambda and t, yeah. sort of. So there is. Because you're only minimizing over beta. Right? So how do you deal with the lambda and t? Um, I'm going to, can I, I, I'm going to cover that later, if that's OK. Um, I'm going to talk about it now, so a good segue. But uh, <laughs> when it comes to actually choosing it, I'll get into it that a, a little later. Um, so yeah, when it comes to the, uh, the lambda, the t, the regularization penalty, this is what is actually going to allow us to directly control this bias variance trade-off. And to kind of see this, we can look at some of the, the extremes where, on one hand, if we set lambda equal to zero, then that penalty term is just going to drop right out. So we're going to be back to using least squares. At the other end of the spectrum, as it gets really big, as it goes to infinity, that's where we're now going to be putting a lot of weight on that penalty, and we're going to really be shrinking those coefficients uh, down to zero. And again, what we're really doing is we're just going to sacrifice some bias. So we're essentially starting out at the least squares estimates. We're shrinking them towards zero, so we're introducing some bias because the least squares coefficients themselves are either unbiased or have very low bias. Uh, but in exchange, we're hopefully going to be reducing the variance, so overall our prediction is going to actually uh, improve. And so, uh, as Justin was kind of alluding to, you know, when we change that, that lambda parameter, that tuning parameter, we're going to get a different solution. So we're really going to end up having just a ton of different actual 
coefficient sets essentially one for each lambda and this is going to be uh, a crucial choice because again this is what is controlling this bias variance trade-off for us uh, but for now I'm going to wait until a little later to actually uh, to get into that. Are there any questions on the uh, the tuning parameter at all? So last time Justin talked about ridge regression quite a bit the other really classical uh, example of regularized regression is, is the lasso. And so this was introduced by uh, Tip Shirani in 1996. And this is just using a different penalty. Instead of using the sum of the squared coefficient values, now we're just going to use the sum of the absolute values, which uh, can also be represented by the, uh, the L1 vector norm. And so again, all I'm doing is I'm basically just taking the framework we start out with, and then I'm just going to be using this different penalty, so I'm just going to plug that in down here. That's going to give me my, uh, my lasso estimates. So this might seem like a subtle change, because really both of these penalties are kind of getting at the same thing. We're trying to look at the magnitude of our coefficients. We're using the L1 vector norm versus the L2 vector norm. Even if you don't know what those are, 1 and 2 are similar, so the vector norms are, are similar. Uh, but this subtle change actually makes quite a bit of difference in the sense that not only does the lasso shrink coefficients towards zero, but it's actually going to set some of them to be exactly zero. So it's going to, this is going to be the case where we're actually getting a form of continuous variable selection is that not only while we estimate are we going to get our coefficient estimates, but it's also going to at the same time tell us, you know, what are the relevant variables? What are the ones that have the the non-zero coefficients that we actually want to keep in our model. And for that reason, the lasso name is not just, you know, Rob Tipsharani on a horse with a lasso going around wrangling up a bunch of predictors. It actually is just because it was the least absolute shrinkage. Uh, because again, we're doing shrinkage using the absolute value function. Um, but it's also doing selection at the same time. So that's why it's called the, the least absolute shrinkage and uh, selection operator. Uh, a way to see this vision, oh yeah, what's up? Um, so the other function reduces your beta um, even more though, right? The one with the beta squared. So it's giving you a higher error, so it's shrinking your beta down smaller. Um, well, it's still tough because, I mean, in both cases, I mean, it's tough because both cases you have the tuning parameter that's going to kind of fine tune that. Yeah. Um, so you can always kind of equivalently kind of get the same, I guess, amount of shrinkage. Just they, they might need two different tuning parameters to do that. But um, um, are you just saying just how the oh, size is measured? Just the penalty is smaller for this one, it looks like, right? Compare, yeah, just looking straight at the penalty, yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. The, the square to be so why would um, this one be able to set them to zero and the other one? Um, so that actually, I think it's easier to see it in this graph. Um, so this, basically here, like I showed with Ridge, one way to do it is that you can, you can look at it in terms of just constrained um, least squares. And so here we're actually looking at, we have these two constraint sets. So here, this corresponds to lasso. You can just kind of think of, you know, with the absolute value function, we have this V function with a sharp point right at the origin. And so that's where, that's why we're getting these sharp points here. Whereas uh, with Ridge over here, we just kind of have this smooth ball as our constraint set. And so why the lasso is able to set stuff exactly to zero is because of this constraint set and the fact that we have these sharp edges right at zero. So it's more likely that the coefficients are going to hit a sharp edge and be stuck there at zero. Yeah, what's up? In which context are you, like, one better than the other? Um, well, that's a good question. And uh, Josh is going to cover that actually next week. <laughs> but. Um, but that is a good, a good thing, and I and, and in, in my practice, I usually kind of just estimate both and kind of pick from there. But there are kind of situations kind of going into it where you can might maybe expect one to do a little better. But um, Josh is going to get into that a little more next week. Uh, so kind of a more general way to look at the regularization framework is that uh, so you know earlier we were dealing with. I was sticking in squared the squared error loss here. Like Justin had mentioned earlier, we actually have several different loss functions that we can use. So we have absolute error, 0, 1. We can use a negative log likelihood if we want to use kind of a more uh, generalized linear model. Uh, so we have a lot of flexibility not only in the loss function that we use, but we can also play around with the penalty function. And actually, uh, 
Uh, kind of a decade ago, that was a kind of a huge research area where people were basically just going around and trying at different penalty functions and trying to find their properties. Even what Suchit was saying, kind of, okay, here's the penalty, in what situation does it work well, is it better than the lasso, that sort of stuff. Uh, so you can see that the lasso is pretty popular, so a lot of these are basically just a word in front of the lasso, just different types of lassos. So um, I kind of wish I would have discovered the lasso, but, um, <laughs> but there are, all, are other are methods. Uh, even smoothing splines can be fit into the regularization framework. So, so this is a really general framework because we not only have a loss function that we can play with, but we have the penalty that we can change and kind of get a different, uh, different setup. And the penalty function, I think, is cool because it allows us to actually incorporate prior knowledge into, uh, into what we're doing. So sparsity is going into it if I have a ton of predictors, but I think that only maybe five or 10 of those are going to be relevant. So I can incorporate that, for example, maybe with the lasso or, or if there's a certain structure with the estimates. Maybe I think adjacent coefficients are going to be similar in size, or maybe I think there's going to be some sort of grouping structure to the coefficient. The, the different penalties allow us to kind of exploit that structure, and in doing that, in imposing that knowledge into our estimation is going to then end up with getting better, better estimates, better, better prediction. Are there any questions on regularization or the general, uh, the general setup with anything? <clears throat> I've got a side question. Yeah. Um, did the frequentists take issue with the fact that you can incorporate prior knowledge in the penalty? <laughs> um, from my understanding, no. I mean, I haven't really talked to a lot of frequentists about this, but. Um, the ones I have, they seem to just kind of, I mean, they almost think, see that as a strength, which is, because I think they yeah, view it, stupid, well, but I think the, the, the difference here is, I mean, maybe it's hypocritical, but I think they view it more of, okay, there's this known objective structure that exists, and so I'm just trying to ex incorporate that into my estimation and not, I think they don't see it as this subjective messing around with different priors and that sort of stuff. It's more of, okay, there's just, there's just some objective structure that exists with the coefficients or with the data I'm working with, and so I'm just going to try to take advantage of it to get better prediction. But I see your point to that, that it kind of seems like a little hypocritical that um, 